In the beginning of every year, ICMPD, the International Center for Migration Policy Development, publishes its migration outlook on the year ahead. The outlook describes which migration events might be relevant this year and how this conclusion or so-called prediction can be drawn. The lead behind this process is the ICMPD Principal Advisor Martin Hoffmann, who is joining me today to give us an overview of the 10 things to look out for in 2023. Dear Martin, great to have you back. It has been exactly one year since we recorded the Migration Outlook for 2022, which was also our very first podcast episode. It is therefore today our anniversary, and uh, so it's particularly great that you are back here and uh, we can do this again. So if you recall our discussion from a year ago, we did mention Ukraine, but it was in a rather labor migration related context. What happened then in 2022 was more than unpredictable for most of us. What are the touch points now in the outlook 2023, if you look on the entire Ukraine topic? Good morning, Elizabeth, first of all, and thank you for having me. Last year when we discussed Ukraine, we discussed labor migration, but we also discussed that we were in an uncertain phase of a build-up of a migration situation. It was clear that something is going on at the borders of Ukraine. And also last year's outlook included the reference to the 2014 situation in Ukraine. And based upon that said, well, if hostilities start, then uh, we can expect displacement again and uh, also people fleeing to other countries. What nobody foresaw at the time was uh, the extent, the dimension, because nobody could imagine even one month before it started that there would be really a fully-fledged attempt to conquer the whole of Ukraine, which then initiated this huge migration movement or refugee movement, the largest since the end of the Second World War in Europe. So that was unpredicted in size and dimension. When we want to put that in perspective, uh, Europe experienced in the last 30 years three major refugee situations or crises, as they are also sometimes called. The first one in the context of the Balkan Wars in the 1990s. Uh, then 1.1 million refugees came to northern and western Europe in a period of 80 years altogether. The refugee crisis 2015-2016, it was 2.6 million over a time span of two years. And last year it was nearly 5 million refugees from Ukraine registered for temporary protection in a time span of six months. So this is really the biggest and largest refugee situation we had in Europe and put enormous challenges on uh, the member states of, of the EU and other European countries. And now what are the for you the main uh, points now regarding Ukrainian refugees in the, the outlook for 2023? The first point is the scenarios, how will the situation develop? Do we have to expect another wave or huge inflow from Ukraine? And that is uncertain. It depends very much on the course of the war. We all know that uh, Russia switched uh, strategy in, in autumn, consistently attacking uh, Ukrainian civil infrastructure, which has not resulted yet in an increase in flows. But we cannot rule that out to happen in the future. Once livelihoods collapse completely because of that, we might see uh, a second big wave. So European states prepare for scenarios between 500,000 and 4 million. That's a huge spread, of course, but it's wise to be prepared for that. The second point we have to consider is the integration or economic inclusion of Ukrainian refugees uh, who have arrived last year overwhelmingly um, women with small children. Uh, we know from past experience that the second, third year of a refugee coming uh, to a host country are the years when, when they start to enter uh, the labor markets in uh, significant numbers. We have seen this already in Poland. This is a particular situation because there is a strong tradition, a long tradition of Ukrainians uh, working there, so there it happened a bit faster 
For the other EU member states, it will depend a lot on to which extent integration measures function. And again, we speak about huge numbers with very particular integration challenges, childcare, language, uh, also the fact uh, that they could not prepare for this situation, uh, lacking social networks in many EU member states. But they have also very favorable characteristics, general level of education, work experience that is very usable on European labor markets, which anyhow are tight and need labor force. So specific integration measures or specific uh, integration trajectories for this group will be something to watch out for in the course of the year. And the third point is the discussion on what does the future bring in terms of the protection status of these people. The activation of the Temporary Protection Directive for the first time in history meant that they have immediate access to labor markets and other types of services without an examining of the individual case. Uh, and that was a very wise decision. It prevented a border crisis from happening and it definitely helped all countries to manage uh, the situation. But as the term says, temporary is intended to be temporary. So yeah. what will be the exit from that situation? It won't happen this year because it has been prolonged, the status, until at least uh, February, March 2024. But there should be a discussion on what the future might bring for these people. The main options are return, of course, permanent residence or other types of protection status. It will be between return and other types of residence status, ideally a combination. Mm -hmm. Ukraine uh, wants her people back as soon as this is possible. Um, they will have a very important role in recovery and reconstruction. That is also a novelty. Normally you don't have that strong uh, commitment of a home country to, mm -hmm. to take the people back. And that might not be necessarily in the interest of the refugees themselves. And it might not be in the interest of the labor markets uh, of the current host countries who will want to keep these people as soon as they have entered. So it's about devising a global comprehensive strategy that benefits everybody involved to the, to the extent possible. And that is a political process that needs to be based on a political discussion. And as you know, ICMPD engages very much uh, in this discussion. We have devoted our annual policy initiative to this very topic. And the discussion will take place next year. I'm sure about that. Great. Now looking at the ICMPD migration outlook specifically, the point number five addresses the instrumentalization of migration, or in other words, the weaponization of migration. Where do we stand on this and why did you even put it in the kind of top 10 things to look out for in 2023? Yeah, question already includes uh, the reason why it is relevant to discuss it, namely the distinction between instrumentalization and weaponization. Mm -hmm. Instrumentalization is a phenomenon that was always there. It's basically governance trying to use migration-related issues to benefit in their external relations with other countries. And that has been often the case. But normally it meant that those countries trying to use migration or instigating um, certain developments were in a difficult migration situation themselves and just tried to make use of it. Now, weaponization or instrumentalization as a means of hybrid aggression means that migration issues are integrated in broader, you can say, war strategies. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they become really a weapon. And that was the case last year when we discussed Belarus, where at the time everybody wondered why is Belarus doing that, uh, actively recruiting migrants to Belarus then to organize their onward journey to the EU. Mm -hmm. We can assume, meanwhile, it was not Belarus, it was uh, already Russia behind that, with the intention to destabilize the Union. Uh, these countries know that this is a highly polarized topic and EU member states try to avoid irregular arrivals as much as possible. So it becomes 
part of a war strategy to say, well, let's put pressure on, on the EU via this channel in order to get concessions. So it has a new quality and it has continued throughout last year. Again, uh, attacks on the Ukrainian uh, civilian infrastructure were also intended to uh, set in motion another second wave to overburden the and acceptance. that did not happen. That did not happen. But now, very recently, end of last year, um, it became obvious that, that Russia now organizes uh, flights to the exclave of Kaliningrad, bordered at Poland, again from the Middle East, because obviously the Russian side has learned that uh, the Europeans are not scared of Ukrainians and that this does not work, this scheme. So now I switch back to the initial Belarus scheme, trying mm -hmm. to bring migrants from the Middle East uh, and obviously then trying to push them on further to uh, EU member states' territory. Whether it will work or not, we cannot tell now, but we s clearly see the attempt. And this also means that, like with any other weapon, as soon as it's in the world, it stays in the world. So uh, attempts to use real immigration as a weapon will not be limited to incidents or single cases, but will be a constant the EU has to deal with. And another case where migrants were maybe instrumentalized is also touched upon in the in the outlook. The um, point number six, the debate over visa regimes in the EU and beyond is a little bit based on the case of Serbia having a special entry or no visa requirements for certain countries in the last years. Can you say something about that? Yeah, here I have a bit of a different opinion, I have to say, because for me this is still not clear whether that was really uh, an attempt to instrumentalize uh, migration or whether this just happened. Uh, Serbia had introduced more favorable visa procedures for Indian citizens already in 2017 with the intention to improve economic relations with India and also to create uh, investment and business environment in Serbia for citizens from India. And then two things happened. First, practically, uh, these procedures were cumbersome and Indian citizens complained everything takes too long. So that is why facilitation always means fast procedures, contrary to uh, okay. even favorable visa procedures. Then COVID happened. So there was the mobility crunch and nobody could move anyways. And as soon as Uh, COVID was over and the mobility restrictions, then this scheme started to materialize that uh, Indian citizens would go to Serbia and then organize their regular onward journey from there, presumably with the help of smuggling networks who have figured out that that's an opportunity. That was the case for India. Uh, Serbia also had visa-free or very favorable visa conditions with North African countries, because of economic interest. And then there was, of course, also the issue of the recognition of, of Kosovo. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying that instrumentalization, in a sense, was not part of the whole situation, but I don't see it as the, as the main factor. Mm -hmm. That, again, here we are in the old instrumentalization discussion, that irregular migration flows through your country towards the EU always improve your negotiating position towards the EU mm -hmm. that is known and that will also have been known in the case of, of Serbia. But I still don't see it as the main aspect of the situation. And pretty quickly, one has to say, uh, the EU managed to have an agreement with Serbia that uh, these possibilities do not exist anymore. So there is no visa-free entry of uh, Indian or Tunisian uh, nationals to Serbia anymore as of the beginning of January. But as you have said, instrumentalization, however you want to interpret it, will be part of the European migration situation and you have to deal with it. What did the EU do so far? Two levels we have to discuss first, you can say ad hoc, fast political decisions to react, it was very successful in the case of Belarus, mm -hmm. using a whole range of measures And I have to emphasize this, always in cooperation also with countries of origin and, and mm -hmm. transit, otherwise it wouldn't have worked. So that's one strand. I still think that's very remarkable. Two achievements last year. The Belarus situation, we must not conceal that was 
also heavily criticized with regard to uh, asylum seekers and refugees' rights mm -hmm. that were, of course, uh, affected by that. Still, it was a very volatile situation, resolved pretty quickly. At the other end of the spectrum, as I've said, the activation of the Temporary Protection Directive, again, without looking from one day to the other, more or less, without looking in the small print, uh, that has also managed a case of instrumentalization right. very well. So we have this strand, but then the strand, like always in our systems, is there like a legal basis for doing this. And there was already at the end of uh, 2021 a proposal to adopt an instrumentalization regulation that would lay down legally binding procedures and instruments uh, for such a case. It was proposed by the Commission, debated, discussed, further developed last year. A compromise could not have been found yet, but don't see this as a, as a negative sign. Uh, European Union policy and lawmaking is not that fast, so one mm -hmm. year would have been extremely fast. And I expect that the discussion dis continues throughout next year, and then maybe a compromise can be found next year. It would be important to have such a basis in the long run. As I've said, uh, the phenomenon will return. And in the long run, you should be able to rely on institutional setups, support functions, and so on and so forth, uh, so that you don't have to invent or reinvent everything once the case appears again. And for this, this lawmaking is important. So hopefully, it will. the work will continue, and hopefully... There's progress on it. Thank you, Martin. The other main concern for many people is uh, irregular migration. And here you have mentioned the two routes that are currently and probably in 2023 going to be the ones that are relevant for Europe. Can you say something about that, please? Irregular arrivals, when they are detected, are assigned to uh, certain routes. And that is rather statistically category or analytical category and we have the main routes um, that are monitored every year the eastern mediterranean central and western mediterranean routes the western balkan routes the west africa routes so those are the main routes and when cases encounter along those are encountered along those routes uh, they end up in the statistics there and there we've seen in the last years already a shift towards uh, the so-called Western Balkans route and the Central Mediterranean route. The latter leading from Libya and increasingly Tunisia to Italy mainly and the Western Balkan route through the Western Balkan countries. And last year, these two routes accounted for 75% of all detected cases. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a concentration we have hardly ever seen before. But Uh, the expression of a trend that has already started earlier. So it's pretty safe to say that these two main routes will be in the center of attention and in the center of movements or also next year or this year. Does it then make it actually easier for the EU to deal uh, with it if you know that people are coming mainly through a very limited amount of countries? Not necessarily, because in case of point of departure Libya, you have the problem as a country Uh, with largely eroded uh, state structures, to put it uh, diplomatically, with two competing governments, mm -hmm. uh, where it is not clear with whom you can actually we'll negotiate together, and conclude right? agreements yeah. in a binding way. There is a lot of uh, cooperation with Libya still, but it will be very difficult to cut off uh, this point of uh, departure to Europe completely. In the Balkans, it is also a very complex uh, uh, situation. Now, the agreement with Serbia uh, regarding visa will definitely help to, to address part mm -hmm. of the problem there. We do not only speak about India, we also speak about Tunisia and other countries that had visa-free access to Serbia. So there's the potential that uh, the pressure reduces there. But the Western Balkan route is, of course, the route that connects the EU with the most important conflict areas when it comes to irregular migration and the, the origins of asylum seekers, Afghanistan and Syria, or Syria and Afghanistan, that would be the right order. Whereas we know, uh, in case of Afghanistan, there was a lot of public attention 
towards the fact that the situation has worsened a lot in the country. Not so much attention in case of Syria, but there it has worsened even more. Yeah, the numbers are quite shocking, in fact, yeah. The, the numbers from a basis that was shocking in the beginning, it becomes more shocking every year. And then we have, of course, large refugee populations from these countries in the region, in Iran, Pakistan, from Afghanistan, in Turkey, from Syria, Lebanon, also from Syria. And in those uh, countries hosting much larger populations from these, from these origin countries than Europe, the economic situation and also political situation also worsened uh, during last year and will worsen even further next year. So we also have to expect secondary movements, as they are called, from, from Afghans, for instance, currently residing in Iran or Pakistan. And so in technical terms, we use the word pressure, although it's not very elegant. The pressures will definitely increase. Whether they materialize in increasing movements or not, we cannot really foretell A lot of depends on do the people even have the means to move, to which extent can stepped up uh, border control measures, control measures, reduce the flows. They have the potential to do that, but we cannot really be sure or certain whether this will be the case or not. Based on my experience, I rather expect levels like this year may be slightly reduced because of uh, that uh, the agreement with Serbia takes out certain numbers may be slightly increased because of the worsening situation. Mm -hmm. I do not expect big waves as, as we've seen 2015, 2016 uh, next year, but I have to admit I might be wrong on that. We have now touched already upon some of the regions and on everything regarding asylum and uh, unfortunately irregular border crossings. But there are also some developments that you think in 2023 we can categorize probably as positive developments with regards to regular pathways. What are the news here that we can expect? What can we expect First, what is the background? The background is that due to demographic aging, the demands on European labor markets increase constantly, uh, something that was uh, long expected and which started to materialize two, three, four years ago. And that's a constant, continuous, irreversible development. We're getting older as societies and the number of people in working age shrinks. And would say last year and this year, we have reached a situation where it is felt in the business sector, in the economy, everywhere. I think we all constantly meet people who run businesses and tell us we're looking for people. We, we don't find anyone at all levels. So although it's a long-term trend, I would say the political pressure or the pressure within uh, our societies to do something about it has really materialized last one, two, three years. And meanwhile, European governments start to react. And uh, that was a very remarkable. And I see positive development that many of them have started to negotiate, but already to conclude so-called migration and mobility partnerships mm -hmm. with non-European uh, countries. India has concluded many already. Austria was one of the last cases to announce before Christmas that they will also conclude one. And the main purpose of these agreements is to ensure orderly, well-managed uh, and functioning labor migration from those countries to EU labor markets. And that for the first time in ag agreements with non-European partners, we have shared interests mm -hmm. it's a new quality normally it was about trying to find a deal between european control interests and the country of origin economic interests or mm -hmm. their own citizens rights interest and though there are many agreements and there was always constructive dialogue in reality the partners did not share one and the same interest and that is new now because still for countries of origin there is the interest that their citizens can migrate in a lawful way, work abroad and also send home remittances. 
And now the Europeans for the first time have the interest that they really come and work here. And this brings an entirely new quality to such agreements. It will be immensely complex and complicated to actually develop and implement them. But I think the basis is there for the first time. The political basis, uh, which ideally is always based on needs and interests and not on altruistic motivations that normally don't materialize then in the, in the real world. So here I see really a game changer, mm -hmm. the demographic development when it comes to cooperation with non-European countries on migration. And also the forecast regarding labor markets for next year is rather positive despite of an expected uh, economic downturn. Yeah. The labor markets should be rather resilient so we don't have to expect a big increase in unemployment because of an economic downturn in the EU. So for next year, I also don't uh, expect the debate to swing completely to now we have to protect our labor markets again. That does sound very positive indeed. So we're moving more towards a Canadian approach to migration. The uh, Canadian approach is basically based on a so-called points system. So it admits people on certain Socio, let's say, demographic uh, credentials, age, language, uh, prior education, and does not link the admission to a concrete job offer, which was for long the predominant way to manage it in the EU. Mm -hmm. So you had to have a concrete contract, more or less, mm -hmm. uh, in order to enter. So now Europe switches more also to this points based mm -hmm. model, at least that is what is politically declared. How this works in reality, we don't know yet, but uh, you're right, at least strong Canadian elements will be the basis for the, for the future admission policy in the EU. Now, uh, we have, we were, I think, um, having a really good sort of overall impression. So this is everything that you're mentioning now is um, in more details and undermined with And lots of numbers and statistics. Um, everybody can read this up in the Outlook. And the Outlook is comprised sort of of three sections. So the first one are really the 10 major points. Then we have the regions and then we have the trends. Now I would like to know a little bit more about the different regions. And from your perspective, you have now, I think you mentioned probably 20 countries, which is uh, more than we can cover here. And it's also more than we used to cover in the past years. So you have an increase, first of all, in kind of the region where the regions in general, which is not a great development, I suppose. But if you had to pick uh, maybe one country or region, what would you pick in terms of unexpected predictions for migration in 2023? First of all, I think if you allow me, I would like to briefly address why does the list of countries get longer and longer? Because more countries become relevant uh, compared to five, six years ago. Uh, that's one of the mega trends that uh, also this trend towards irregular migration displacement uh, increases constantly and involves more countries than before in terms of relevance for Europe. It's not that these countries have not been affected in the past, but increasingly from these countries, asylum seekers or irregular migrants arrive. And second thing I would like to say is that this is by no means limited to uh, Europe and the EU. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a trend from the countries of the global south to the countries of the global north. In the United States last year, they observed an increase of 41% of cases or encounters, as they call it, at the southern border, and almost seven times more attempted arrivals by boat than the year before. And uh, although the US have a stricter stance on uh, asylum rights than, than we have, although the US have concluded many agreements uh, as we have. So we see here a mega trend that affects at least those countries of, of the global north that have land borders with uh, regions uh, that are unstable and uh, economically in a bad situation. So would I single out uh, a region, would I single out countries? 
maybe I would refer to uh, two first where one where it's not so much in the in the in the in the public eye that many uh, asylum seekers in the EU come from this region and that would be Latin American countries right. uh, quite a tradition uh, with with high uh, application figures in the EU that came to a preliminary end during the COVID years when there were hardly any flights uh, to to uh, the EU and this has bounced back now and when we speak about an increase of asylum um, uh, application figures in the EU this is largely owed to uh, bounce back to pre-COVID trends with regard mm -hmm. to uh, uh, refugee asylum seekers from Latin American countries and I think the public is not really aware of, of this fact that we speak about way more than 100, 120, 150,000 per year. A second region I think we have to uh, observe very carefully are North African uh, countries where there is good cooperation and normally also the, the, the number of asylum seekers of these individual countries is not that high but in some it's a relevant factor uh, and we see these countries uh, very much affected by the global supply crisis by the cost of living crisis Egypt, Tunisia depend very much on, on food imports from, from Ukraine and Russia and all, yeah. other goods. So uh, soaring cost of living costs there. This might prompt secondary movements. These countries have also uh, large numbers uh, or large populations of immigrants themselves that are in a very bad position at the moment. But also it might be uh, a catalyst for uh, citizens of those countries themselves to try to reach Europe. So here's a priority uh, to see that the cost of living crisis in those countries is kept under control. If this is not the case, we might see significant increases coming from those countries uh, in the next phase, couple of months this year. Iran is a question. Just like uh, Southern African countries or Sub-Saharan uh, countries, that are always much in the discussion uh, in, in total numbers, uh, asylum seekers uh, and also irregular arrivals from Iran never featured among the top nationalities of origin. Never. There seems to be different migration patterns uh, involving Iran, try to move rather in, in, in families, but don't move that much mm -hmm. principally. Mm -hmm. And we have a sanctions regime that is many years old now that really worsened the living conditions of many, but obviously not to the extent that they actually left the country. So in relative terms, uh, Iran is still a prosperous country in the region, which makes it also a main destination. So uh, most Afghan uh, refugees do not go to Europe or Turkey, but go to Iran and Pakistan, mainly Iran. Uh, and this is what also something we have to take into account now. Now, an increasingly oppressive environment might or even will prompt the urban elites or parts of the urban elite to consider moving abroad. But in total numbers, this will be rather limited. The real issue for me is to which extent does the economic uh, situation wors worsen for the millions of migrants in Iran because of a combined effects of, of sanctions, in, in increasing sanctions and instability uh, due to uh, the protests, this might uh, prompt considerable secondary movements out of Iran then towards Turkey and the EU. So those are developments we also have to observe. As, as you see, it's for me difficult to single out a country or a region it's many. Yeah. When we speak about asylum seekers and uh, irregular arrivals, we have a general tendency to expect for next year that the situation uh, gets more difficult in those countries. I thought in preparation of this meeting, is there any region where I see a significant improvement in the situation that would stabilize also movements? And I cannot think of any region where it is expected that the situation is better next year than this year. Mm -hmm. So our figures are composed of many uh, countries of origin, uh, origin nationalities. And yeah, for most of them, uh, I don't see 
uh, really a positive de development for the next year. Coming to a completely different uh, region now and a bit of a different question uh, towards the end of our of our um, interesting talk, Sub-Saharan Africa and the number of IDPs. Can you say something about that? Sub-Saharan or Southern African countries traditionally are by numbers uh, the most important and also longest protected refugee situation in or displacement situation in the world more than 40 million idps refer to internally displaced so people that have been displaced but not across borders but stay inside uh, of the borders of their home country and principally when we speak about the displaced or globally displaced meanwhile 104 million a staggering figure staggering increase compared to 10 years ago Again, in their majority, they are internally displaced, mm -hmm. also in, in Ukraine, also in Syria. And this is the main pattern that you see in, uh, in African countries, either internally displaced or really staying in the neighboring mm -hmm. countries. And only a very small fraction of the displaced then actually tries to make it uh, to Europe. What's the general impact on the country if you have a vast amount of internally displaced people? Yeah, first of all, it's the expression of that something is going really bad in, or really wrong in your country. Uh, this means it's normally uh, conflict-related or natural disaster-related. And both main drivers of internal displacement or displacement in general have increased in significance also last year. So there is the, in African countries, so there's the, the dual problem of increasing conflict, also due to uh, increasing geopolitical engagement of the main powers in the world. That mm. does not help uh, stability in conjunction with increasing number of natural disasters due to climate change. Mm. And this drives, continues to drive displacement in African countries and worsens the situation. This kind of displacement largely refers to people who do not have the financial means or human capital resources to really make it then to Europe. Uh, so this is uh, also one of the reasons why even increasing displacement does not necessarily lead to increasing arrivals uh, in the EU. You cannot rule it out, but the past experience has always showed that uh, an increase in displacement in African countries did not directly translate into increasing numbers in Europe. Why would Europe still have to care? Well, first of all, Europe and the global community should accept displacement as a, as a joint global responsibility and uh, should do something about the causes and the root causes for it. That's, I think, a principal obligation of all countries that are prosperous and, uh, and um, peaceful to help the others where this is not the case. Uh, and it's clear that, that the conflict triggers more conflict rather than that it's resolved at some point. Mm -hmm. And uh, global stability and more peaceful development and more prosperous development of the world is something that first and foremost uh, touches upon our security interests that we have uh, and migration is not one of them in in in, in my reading uh, so that's that should be in our interest that these countries are politically and uh, economically more stable than now which automatically will reduce displacement and migration as as, as a byproduct and this is why we should care and we can also, also not say that just because in the past we have seen certain trends, that this will continue like that. Mm -hmm. uh, before the war or civil war in Syria started, we could not even uh, use uh, the numbers of Syrians in the EU in, in graphics yeah. because there were always a flat line right. at the x-axis because there were so few. Mm -hmm. And within two years it was millions. So you always have to take into account this can happen from any region in the world. Not likely, 
not likely next year, but still, when you think in the long run, and when you think that also uh, the available uh, financial capital for, for African nationals on average increases and increases, they might be much more in a position to actually try to make it to Europe in three, five or ten years than they are now and then they will come. So it would be great if we, if they didn't have to take this attempt and risk everything. and leave They risk lives. their lives uh, and they lose their money and they <laughs> will end up in a very difficult situation. So again, referring to the migration partnerships, we might have a tool to organize this differently, also in our own interest. And also in their interest, Uh, irregular migration should be prevented to, to the extent uh, possible. And although the outlooks, outlook always only looks at next year, it would be wise to look further ahead in case of policy making. And say maybe we have to preempt a situation or a crisis that, that reaches us in five years or ten years already now and not start dealing with it when the figures go up because then it's too late. Thank you, Martin. So joining me today was Martin Hoffman, ICMPD Principal Advisor. Thanks again. The ICMPD Migration Outlook generally gives you a very good overview so you can feel prepared for any discussion or anything that uh, you may want to talk about in terms of migration. You can also find us, ICMPD, on all big social media platforms And if you want to receive notifications on such publications like the Outlook, please subscribe to our newsletter. We have different ones to select from um, through our website. So thank you very much for tuning in for our anniversary episode and see you next time. Stay up to date on ICMPD's activities and visit our website icmpd.org, sign up for our newsletter and follow us on social media.